Cannabis was a clear winner on election night. So we're going to take a look at what the best return on investment is for potential new cannabis marketplaces, especially uh, relevant with Mexican Senate approving cannabis legalization bill, which is going to be voted on this week. So $6 billion question is which states are likely to legalize recreational cannabis in 2021. We're going to cover a few of those states, including New Mexico, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Connecticut, New York, and then I'm going to throw in Kentucky. We'll talk about why. First off, we're going to start with Joe Biden leaving cannabis reform out of an updated policy that he pledged earlier. So let's just dive into it. Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. So it appears that President-elect Joe Biden, he's already falling short on some of his campaign promises. So when Biden released their transition plan, advocates immediately noticed that reform of cannabis law was not stated in the plan, despite many promises on the campaign trail. So while drug law reform and cannabis legalization are not specifically mentioned in the plan, it is possible that the issues could fall under the umbrella of criminal justice reform. So the new pages say that Biden is working to strengthen America's commitment to justice and reform on criminal justice system, but cannabis legalization or decriminalization is mysteriously absent. So his campaign site, which is still up and running, it includes a section titled Plan for Black America, where he promises to decriminalize the use of cannabis and automatically expunge all prior cannabis use convictions. The fact that this language was in the pre-election press release, but missing from the most recent ones, has many activists very concerned. A Biden campaign spokesman told the marijuana moment that nothing has changed and said that Biden has very important policy plans that are not officially listed on the website yet. Activists have a good reason to be concerned that Biden won't follow through on his promise, considering that he was one of the architects of the war on drugs and has been against cannabis legalization throughout most of his career. And we'll just add that all politicians, or excuse me, bureaucrats, always have promises that they don't follow up on every single time. So we saw recreational cannabis legalization victories at the ballot box in Arizona and New Jersey this month that have set the table for adult use legalization in a handful of nearby states for 2021 with more than $6 billion in business opportunities possibly up for grabs in the next few years. If New York, Connecticut, Maryland, New Mexico are all ripe for 2021 to legalize recreational use through their legislatures. And Virginia recently came out and said that uh, the governor was going to try and pass that through the legislature as well. And so with the pandemic has been draining tax coffers and some looking at recreational cannabis to help offset, offset those losses is exactly what we've been talking about since this podcast started. So the Marijuana Business Daily projects that the recreational cannabis markets in New York and Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and New Mexico could generate more than $2.5 billion in sales combined during the first full year of the program and up to $6.5 billion annually within four years. So legalization would generate new opportunities for plant touching businesses as growers, processors, manufacturers, and retailers all come online. So in addition to the governor of Virginia kind of standing up and saying that they're going to pass this through the legislation, uh, you also have Minnesota that had a possible adult use uh, action for 2021, but it looks like Republicans have one more seat in the Senate that may or may not matter since this is really about money and that crosses both sides of the aisle. Yeah, Missouri, Oklahoma, North Dakota, all could have recreational ballot initiatives in 2022. Ohio is another possibility in 2022. Florida, however, might be more difficult because of the high signature requirements and currently tight timeframes for verification of signatures. And let's not forget about Kentucky. They have um, about two thirds of their entire pension plan uh, not funded. So they're again, they're another way to say that is their pension fund is their pension plans are only funded by a third. So Mitch McConnell is going to be looking towards cannabis to fill those coffers. He has to, unless he just doesn't care and doesn't want to get reelected. I think he's been in the Senate for over 100 years. So there should be better term limits to get people like him out. Um, he wasn't even that much of a, a he should have been a bigger advocate for hemp in his state. Um, he should have been pushing that decades ago and and hasn't. He's a little bit um, irrelevant, I think, as all bureaucrats are. But I think uh, with Kentucky needing the money more than just about everybody other than Illinois, who only had, I think, 34 percent of their pension plan funded and was obvious to to go recreational as they did. 
Kentucky is no different. The lack of pension funds for police officers, teachers, uh, you know, government officials, whoever else still has a pension plan, except for the general public, you know, we don't, but they do. Uh, they're going to have to fund those and cannabis is going to be the only way to fill those those coffers. So uh, look for Kentucky on that list as well, especially with FOMO created with Mexico. We've got a legalization sandwich forming between Canada and Mexico. So the development Latin American cannabis market is going to create that FOMO with the Mexican Senate on Thursday approving a comprehensive adult use uh, legalization bill. Uh, but pending law still faces some hurdles before the doors are fully open to business opportunities in Latin America's second largest consumer market. So the bill was brought to the Senate floor, where it was debated and approved in general terms, making Mexico the third largest country behind Canada in 2018 and Uruguay in 2013, which leaves Mexico a few steps, which is to uh, approve, they need approval by the lower legislative chamber, and then the president and needs to sign the bill into law, assuming that he has no objections. Hopefully it won't take that long after the law is approved, but before any sales can take place, the cannabis agency must be established and secondary rules written. So any kind of regulatory board to put that together and get stores open is going to take some time, but hopefully not more than a year or two. Lawmakers were originally given an October 2019 deadline, but then after the Senate failed to reach a consensus, the Supreme Court gave them until the end of April 2020. But because of the pandemic, that deadline was extended until December 15th. So they could see some further modifications and yet unforeseen hurdles like we've seen in every single rollout. So countries around the world are taking these steps to legalize adult use cannabis or doing so under their own respective cultural, societal, and economic pretexts. So for example, Uruguay's move was to legalize and had a strong focus on public safety, public health, and human rights. Canada's legalization bill was oriented towards public health outcome. And then Mexico's legalization bill, on the other hand, is strongly oriented around the right to free development of the personality, social justice, and recover peace. So um, it's really all about money. They're going to put all this other stuff in there about, you know, not having it be legal creates, uh, you know, war on drugs and cartels and violence and all of this. Uh, but really, it's um, not about that. It's not about kids and, and uh, seizures with epilepsy. This is about money. And the fact that it's a plant and should just be grown and sold and used just like any other crop or commodity. Uh, but they're going to frame this the way they need to just to get it passed. But uh, the, the real deal is about money. All right. So we're going to look at the best return on investment for potential new business markets, because that's really what this is all about. After the November 3rd election, when there's a lot of would-be entrepreneurs that are kind of eyeballing the cannabis industry, looking at which part of the market is poised to launch and have the best results. Uh, which is going to provide the best return on investment? Could it be retail with lines of customers that stretch around the block? What about cultivation or manufacturing of products? Maybe distribution or even an ancillary company that could provide packaging or security, other type of service. So let's start with uh, ancillary, which is the easiest non-plant touching uh, entity. So maybe the easiest answer for anyone looking to make some money is a possibility of ancillary businesses. The biggest advantage is not having 280E, federal tax code that doesn't allow you to write off expenses. And so if you're not plant touching, then you can operate like a, a normal regular business. Maybe the biggest advantage is the lack of tax burden for ancillary businesses, which inflates their profit margins far beyond what most of the marijuana retailers, growers, and manufacturers enjoy. With this article from MJ Business Daily going on to say that sometimes people who make the best return on investments aren't even the people selling the picks and shovels. It's the people who sell advice on where to get the picks and shovels because that costs nothing. All right, moving on to look at the best return on investment, you need to evaluate each market. You want to look at states that maybe have a limit or don't have a limit on business permits that can be issued. You're looking at like Colorado and Oklahoma and Oregon, for example. Um, others allow only a handful of companies such as Florida, Minnesota, New York. I'll even throw in uh, Ohio. Originally, they were only going to allow five licenses, which is crazy. On the flip side, Oklahoma has twice as many licenses as Oregon. So for Oregon to have approximately 3,500 licenses and, uh, you know, Oklahoma having over 7,000, it's definitely an issue because 
organ had an excess amount. They produced too much. They had too, you know, uh, an excess of supply. So Oklahoma is going to have a massive amount of supply. And it didn't work out too well for Oregon, who had some uh, diversion to the black market or legacy market. Oklahoma is going to have the same issue. There's just too many people producing in that state. So that's going to be an issue. You kind of want to take a look at that and gauge for yourself, which is the right area to be in. You also want to take a look at some states that have vertical integration while others choose to license individual growers and manufacturers and retailers and do that separately. Washington is one of those where it's all separate. A retailer cannot be a producer processor. Uh, whereas in Colorado, you can be vertically integrated. I think that allows for a lot more opportunities. So you kind of want to just gauge and see which markets you want to be in and why. Trying to get the best return on your investment, you also need to understand that cash is king, especially in a pandemic right now. And having that leverage or ability to uh, react with liquidity or having enough cash to take advantage of an opportunity when it arises is going to be paramount. For example, it's a major downside for a lot of retailers to have uh, expensive rent. So cannabis companies are often paying five times the market price for a commercial space because the industry is federally illegal. I'm seeing uh, upwards of $35 to $50 a square foot, uh, wherein some you know, non-cannabis entities are only paying $2 for the same uh, commercial space. So the cost of capital and the cost of capital investment for cultivators and manufacturers is very, very high a lot more than retailers and even more expensive than non-cannabis entities. So a lot less of total operational costs are deductible when it comes to federal taxes on top of that. So again, you kind of want to have cash to leverage yourself and position yourself uh, accordingly. And then a final factor for any new market entrants looking to consider uh, what the best return on, on their investment is going to be is knowing that the landscape is inevitably going to change. The only thing that you can guarantee is that things will not remain consistent. So understanding that um, and planning for federal legalization and the possibility of interstate commerce at some point is going to be coming and understanding that your individual state laws are going to constantly change. You know, we saw in Washington state in 2017, gummy bears were deemed illegal. And then we saw right after that, certain shapes and colors uh, through the market off would have affected 70% of the edibles market. And then we saw CBD beverages banned entirely. And we saw another law that would have uh, limited concentrates to 10%, even though it didn't pass. It took the took about four months of people's lives away from developing real brands as they were concentrated on uh, that legal issue. We've said on this podcast before that Canada isn't going to be able to compete against somebody in Colombia when they can grow for you know under a dollar, or even in Colorado that can manufacture cannabis at $1.30 per gram. Canada can't do it at $6 a gram once legalization opens up. And then if Mexico and the global economy opens up, there's no way that Florida, people that are in Florida right now are, are not going to be able to grow indoors competitively versus somebody else. So why would you grow, you know, the example on this uh, article from MJ Business Daily is why would you grow pineapples in Alaska uh, if you can grow them in Hawaii. So the people that are in Florida thinking that they're going to be able to grow indoors without powdery mildew and all of these other issues that they're going to have due to the climate, uh, it's not going to be feasible long term when that game changes. How are you going to pivot to stay relevant? You, you won't be able to. So anybody who's growing in Florida is going to be severely, um, uh, they're going to suffer financially when legalization happens, the production costs to grow indoors are going to be a lot higher once interstate commerce is legal and give the way to outdoor greenhouse cultivation operations that rely on sunlight, driving costs down. It's just not even going to be competitive. What you're seeing a lot now is the multi-state operators having licensing deals, giving the best return on investment for plant touching businesses. Licensing gives a business passive income from new partners, but also offers brands the ability to build on a national scale. So maybe the best return on investment is building a brand that people really like and then being able to license that brand out to other states. As with any endeavor, risk reward is the ratio you want to be looking for. So what's going to be the best return in, on investment for a potential new cannabis market? Just going to have to come back to the Talking Hedge and find out. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is the Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't. 
and I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.